Now, in response to mounting Western sanctions, Russian President Vladimir Putin has made veiled threats of nuclear war. Russia's strike has not just changed Ukraine, it will change the world. The offensives have appended post-Cold War security and renewed foreign policy debates. The biggest lessons that nations have drawn from this war is not depending on the United States, especially after America abandoned Afghanistan and Ukraine. Now, this might be the start of a change in world order. After the dust settles, the U.S. hegemony is likely to weaken considerably. Seizing on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has suggested that Japan should consider hosting the U.S. nuclear weapons. The 67-year-old politician said that Japan could seek an arrangement similar to NATO's nuclear sharing policy. The policy allows countries without nuclear arms to keep such weapons on their soil for potential use in wartime. Now, for more on this international affairs expert, uh, Professor D James D.J. Brown now joins us live from Tokyo, Japan. Professor Brown, thanks so much for joining us on Beyond World is One. Thank you. My first question, as we just told our viewers, quite an explosive statement coming from Japan's former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe that Japan should consider hosting the U.S. nuclear weapons. There's been quite a lot of pushback, especially from the current Prime Minister. What more can you tell us about this? Yeah, so uh, first of all, to mention that um, former Prime Minister Abe is in a bit of a freer position to speak now. Uh, he's no longer uh, in the cabinet. He is still a prominent member of the, the party, but he's able to, to speak more about his, his own views. And so he has made this statement. Let's be clear about what he's saying and what he's not saying. He didn't say that absolutely, definitely this should occur anytime soon. Rather, he said that it shouldn't be a taboo. He wants to begin a debate about whether this should be the next phase in the development of Japan as a security actor. We've already seen a number of changes over the last 10 or 20 years with Japan becoming a more normal actor and really kind of stretching some of the restrictions that were placed on it after the Second World War. And in our base view, it's um, time to, to go even further and even to consider hosting U.S. nuclear weapons. Right, absolutely. Let's talk about the larger fallout of the Ukraine conflict, as we just told our viewers. Will the Ukraine conflict essentially push other countries to reevaluate their nuclear programs or the lack thereof? Yes, I think that, that that is going to be a factor, that Ukraine is a country that did have nuclear weapons, uh, albeit briefly. Uh, it inherited nuclear weapons from the Soviet Union. They were on their territory and they decided to give them up to give them up in exchange for security guarantees from, from Russia, from the United States and from the UK. And it's clearly been shown that um, those security guarantees in particular from, from Russia uh, were not worth anything. And so that I think will encourage some countries to really reevaluate their situation and to consider that uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, true security lies in their, in their own military capabilities. Right. Uh, let's talk about the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine conflict at large as of now. Russian forces are closing in on the capital, Kiev. This according to U.S. intelligence. We just heard the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov say and essentially blame the West led by the United States for influencing Ukraine on all policy and sort of deciding what's democratic and what's not. So what according to you is Vladimir Putin's endgame at this point? Yeah, well, I think it's quite clear that his, his aim is to, uh, to bring Ukraine under Russia's control. Um, he is clearly aiming to, to topple the Ukrainian government and most likely to impose a, a pro-Russian puppet government. This is a huge miscalculation because it's become abundantly clear that the people of Ukraine will not accept rule from Moscow. Uh, I think Putin has been surprised by the uh, the strength of the Ukrainian people's resistance. And uh, this will go down, I think, as one of the most, um, uh, the largest strategic miscalculations that have been conducted by any leader in many decades. Right. Professor, thank you so much for all those insights. And thanks for joining us at this hour on Beyond World as well. Thank you. Now, for more perspective, we earlier spoke to James Schwamlein, a senior director at the Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategic firm from Washington, D.C. I asked him about Putin's endgame and the effect of sanctions on Russia and the world. Listen in. One of the setbacks in the early stages of the Russian intervention 
um, has been the failure to achieve absolute air superiority. Um, it's a shocking failure, frankly. It, it surprised the Russians and it surprised many outside experts as well um, that the U Ukrainian forces have succeeded in largely from a surface to air cap uh, capability uh, in preventing the Russian Air Force from dominating the skies. Um, a no-fly zone has to be enforced through the use of force, through the use of uh, offensive weapons or the ability to potentially use offensive weapons. Um, the U.S. has been very clear um, for years that uh, while it stands behind its NATO members, and in fact, the Biden administration has surged troops into uh, Eastern Europe, Eastern European NATO countries, um, it's not going to defend Ukraine's territory. Ukraine's not a member of NATO. The treaty obligation, uh, the uh, collective defense uh, obligation does not apply. Um, so the U.S. is not going to be, and NATO is not going to be enforcing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. To do so would effectively be, you know, a direct challenge, a direct challenge to Russia. It would involve U.S. military uh, planes uh, flying up against Russian planes, and, and that's not going to happen. Or that, unless you know, unless the the Russians, I suspect, um, take steps that none of us want to see. Uh, sanctions tend to have a delayed effect by their very design. Um, obviously, it takes time for transactions to be canceled, for banks to make to change rules, for the full mechanisms uh, uh, to block transactions to exist. Um, one of the things we are seeing in this crisis immediately um, is actually a move to divestment and cut off relations with Russian firms. You saw a number of extremely high profile. Um, Western companies getting out of, for example, Russian energy companies. You've seen uh, banks cutting off transactions. I think it's amazing, for example, the Chelsea Football Club um, in the UK, where uh, who has a, had a Russian owner for 20 years, and the Russian owner handed over control to uh, to a, the trustees of the of Chelsea. Um, these are all steps that I think are immediately felt both by you know, a Russian elite and also on the Russian economy. Um, the other element that to watch is in, in terms of the exchange rates and in terms of inflation. When we think about inflation and commodity prices in general, of course, Russia, as we all know, is a major producer of, of oil and natural gas uh, products. Um, it's also a major producer of agricultural products. Um, what it does need is it needs a lot of other inputs. It needs a lot of other machinery parts. It needs a lot of other uh, things that come from the outside world and disruptions to supplies are costly over time. Beyond World is One is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news updates on the move.